Um, does this work? Yeah. Hope it does. Um, okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, America House. Welcome to uh, the presentation. The presentation on uh, lobbying in America, uh, lobbying in Ukraine, 
what are uh, the key similarities and differences, <coughs> and most importantly, what can uh, Ukraine learn from American experience. Um, we will have uh, three speakers tonight. Uh, the first one will be myself. My name is um, Alex Guzenko. Uh, I am um, an alumnus <laughs> of the program called the Public Affairs and Advocacy Institute, uh, which is organized by uh, the American University in Washington, D.C. And uh, to complete that, uh, that program, um, uh, I submitted an application form, uh, got selected, and, uh, and, and, and learned uh, many interesting things, which I would like to share with you tonight. And uh, this would have not been possible without the support uh, from the American Embassy in, uh, in Kiev in Ukraine. And I would like to uh, warmly uh, thank, thank you for, uh, for that. Um, then uh, we'll have uh, two, more, uh, two more speakers, two more colleagues of mine. Uh, Ms. Uh, Yelena uh, Prokopienko from um, PBN Hill and Knowlton, and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Denis Vasilevich from um, uh, what, what, what's the Professional Lobby and Advocacy Institute. From the Professional Lobby, you, you got it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so as I told, I will uh, kick off this session. Uh, I will speak for about 20 minutes, and then we will have uh, a Q&A session then I will give the floor to other speakers and uh, it will work the same way. In the very end, we will have a final round for questions and answers where you would have a possibility to address uh, all three of us. Um, is everybody okay with English with the speed sound? Yes. Okay. Well, um, so lobbying industry in America, uh, things we think we know and things we do not really know. Um, Next slide. Oh, I think I, I can use this thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, a lot of you guys probably know this uh, this this guy. Many of you probably don't know that his real name is Kevin Spacey, but um, <laughs> a lot of people see him as Frank Underwood, yes. A.K.A. Uh, the most powerful person in uh, the United States of America. At least this is what uh, the TV series The House of Cards tries to. Uh, convey to us. Um, so when when actually drafting this presentation, I talked to a number of, of friends of mine and colleagues, and I asked them, well, what what, what do you know about lobbying? And the things they told me uh, were, were were pretty similar to what this guy was doing in in the House of Cards film. Um, however, the, the, that perception or that vision of the industry uh, is not really the most accurate one. Um, so, how people usually see uh, the, the lobbying industry, especially in such a powerful country uh, as the United States of America. So it's usually clandestine, it's, it's murky, a lot of uh, you know, uh, backdoor negotiations, a lot of secrets and so on. It's usually done by rich, rich and old men. Um, yeah, as you can see, Frank Underwood, I think, is, uh, is a good depiction of, of that. Um, it is only oriented on the interests of major corporations, um, usually with the involvement of large sums of money. Um, well, also people like, like, like Frank or any other ob uh, lobbyist um, tend to abuse the relationships uh, they have built throughout, uh, you know, uh, throughout their lifetime. Um, the industry is very unregulated and there is very little ethics involved. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, all of us probably have, have this perception, and you may correct me if I'm wrong, but at least this is, this is the perception I had uh, back in the day. Uh, however, it has changed after uh, I learned more things about it. Uh, so, of course, this backdoor deals, or let's, let, let's call them negotiations uh, this time, just to be politically correct, um, they do take place. Because you know, lobbying is, is about relationships. It's about building relationships, it's about maintaining relationships, and it's about getting the things done. However, this is only the tip of the iceberg. Um, and, 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 this is, and this is something we, we, we think we know. Um, so this, this process of directly, talk, directly talking to people, uh, it's, it's direct lobbying. You go to somebody, you talk, you get your message across, and hopefully you get your things done. Um, however, to get your message across, there, is, there has to be um, a lot more work to be done. And uh, all this 
all this work implies uh, many things. Um, it implies coalition building, uh, media strategy, messaging, mobilizing grassroots, grass stops, uh, managing events, fundraising, uh, you know, working with, with your uh, electorate, working with opposition, and, and so on. Um, so, it's, so it's more complex uh, than, uh, than, than we think. Um, so what, 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 what is lobbying and, uh, and, and, and why do we have it? Um, so lobbying is the citizen's right to speak freely and petition the government. And um, this, this right is actually engraved in um, the most important document of the United States of America. It's the first amendment of uh, the United States Constitution. And um, it actually, yeah, it actually reads like this, that the Constitution guarantees the freedoms concerning religion, expression, um, assembly, and the right to petition, the right to petition the government. Um, so, um, so um, when we elect um, officials to represent our, uh, our, our values and our viewpoints and wishes, um, in, in the government, um, elections is not sort of the, the only point of, of interaction to that. Um, there is also um, uh, the fact that we have to maintain contact with those, legi uh, with those legislators to make sure that um, our, our, our con concerns and our wishes are reflected uh, in the specific, um, uh, specific legislation. Um, Oh yeah, and uh, why do the legislators want to listen to us? So I mean, each of us wants to to get something done. For example, you know, I want you know, I want my my parents to be uh, you know to to have uh, prosperous retirement. However, it it is not like this anymore. So I have a legitimate right, whether in America or in Ukraine, to come to uh, the elected official and say, oh, this is something that concerns me. And uh, in order to win over my vote in the next election, you have to listen to, to what I say, because I will be listening to, uh, well, because I will be electing you for the next term. Uh, so um, all of the officials, they, their uh, target, target goal is to get reelected, and that's why uh, they have to listen to their electorate. And this, therefore, uh, opens a window for communications uh, for being listened and for um, your ideas as a citizen to be reflected uh, in the legislation. Um, so uh, to, uh, to sort of explain uh, the, the entire story of, uh, of lobbying, I would like to bring uh, the following story. It's, it's the story of, uh, of this guy, Bill. And uh, he's 14 years old and uh, Bill is a dog lover. He wants, he wants to get a dog. Um, however, his parents, yeah, you see, uh, pretty strict. Um, uh, they do not allow Bill to to get a dog. Uh, and Bill is 14 years old. He cannot just say, "Oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm moving somewhere and getting myself a dog." Not possible. Uh, so Bill has to convince his parents. And you know, one one way how he how he can do that is that he can come directly to his parents and say, "Mom and Dad, I want a dog." Full stop. Well, is that compelling? Well. Probably not, so Bill has to come up with uh, a different strategy. So what Bill, what, what, what can he do uh, about it? If, if he wants a dog, he wants his, uh, his goal to be accomplished. Well, I think a good way would be to, uh, for Bill to talk to his grandma, because his grandma is also a, a dog lover. <laughs> and, and we all know that Bill's grandma has leverage over uh, Bill's mom. So if Bill's grandma will speak to uh, Bill's mom, his mom would probably say, mm, well, I mean, may maybe Bill is right, maybe we should get him a dog. Um, what would also <coughs> help if, if Bill could, um, could talk to his classmates who also have dogs, and they would say, oh, uh, friends, how about you, you stop over by my house, and uh, my parents see the dog, and, uh, and they will know that a dog is not some sort of a crazy animal uh, that, you know, that, that will you know, ruin the house. Uh, so Bill could also create a visual image so that uh, 
you know, uh, so that his parents know that having a dog is, is not a bad thing. Bill can also go online and, and look for a publication by a famous scientist or, um, you know, an expert on, on dogs. And hypothetically, uh, this study would say, oh, having a dog in the house actually, uh, you know, benefits psychological health of every member of the family. And if Bill could, could show the results of this study to his parents, his parents, uh, you know, they, they would hesitate, but, you know, but, but they will read uh, this uh, scholastic document and they will say, well, I mean, uh, argument one sounds compelling, argument two more compelling, three, yeah, let's get a dog. And this is how Bill uh, can get his message across. Very simple, even a 14-year-old can do that. Uh, however, things get, get complicated as we grow up. Uh, all of us probably know uh, you know, what, what it feels, um, uh, you know, to, to mature and sort of enter a different life with different problems. Um, so, uh, Bill grows up, he becomes 40 years old, uh, he's a, a chief executive officer of, uh, you know, a major corporation, doesn't matter, it can be a, a big bank or, you know, an, an investment co corporation, whatever. Bill is responsible for the jobs of 5,000 people. Um, he's, uh, he's a law obedient guy, um, he, pays, uh, he pays taxes, he follows all the regulations. Um, however, at some point the government says, well, um, we have to increase the tax on, uh, on, on, on your company because we think that what you pay is, is, is insufficient, so you have to pay more. <clears throat> and, of course, and, and if Bill has to pay more, his employees will get less. So in order to protect the rights of, of his employees, uh, Bill, have, Bill has to come up with a strategy how to, um, well, how, how to talk to the government in order to um, alter or to uh, amend government's proposal. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the, the goal is still, is still the same. It's basically about getting the things done and getting what you want. However, the tactics uh, slightly change. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, also, um, I told that Bill represents a large corporation, um, but Bill can can also can also be a, a smaller uh, a representative of a smaller medium enterprise. He can be a politician or a runner-up. He can be a representative of a trade union or a professional union. He can even be a university professor professor um, who is a member of this you know particular professional organization. He can be a member of an, uh, a non-governmental organization. He can even be uh, you know, an, an official in the national or in the foreign government. Or you know, he can be pretty much anybody else because we all want, uh, we all want uh, to get things done. And we want to get um, our message across. It's just that all of us have, um, well, have different goals. <coughs> For example, some of us, um, want to, let's say, um, increase the salary for our employees. Some of us want uh, more social security for whether ourselves or our parents. The representatives of uh, minority groups, they want their rights to be protected. They, they maybe want uh, more, more, more benefits about, um, you know, a, about a particular area which, uh, which affects them. Um, or it can even be, uh, you know, at a student union, uh, which which is trying to lobby to get uh, you know a, a new research center at the university. So you know we, we can lobby, we can advocate for a whole range of things, um, and uh, we do not really need to be this big bank or big corporation to uh, to get our message across. Um, so um, how how does this um, work in? Um, in, in America, and uh, uh, as, as Bill is an American citizen, uh, he, well, this, all, all, all of these facts would uh, probably apply to, to him. Um, so um, a typical lobbyist in, in America uh, would probably be a retired politician. Um, why is that? Because if you're in politics, you have access to people. And um, Access is um, a very important element if you want to, uh, well, to, to appeal to people, uh, to be compelling, and to get uh, your message across. So working um, in the government helps a lot. Um, 
in America, uh, lobbying industry is uh, quite big. Uh, so it generates uh, roughly uh, three billion per year, and um, uh, and according to some statistics, they say that uh, the industry generates up to nine billion. But that that is not verified. This is, you know, this is what what probably what people want to hear, or maybe that that is something that is. Um, also, um, lobbying is, um, you know, is, is, is regulated. Every lobbyist, uh, whether, uh, well, in Washington, D.C. has to be registered with the government. So the government needs to know that uh, this particular person is involved in this particular activity. And that is why uh, the government or law enforcement institutions have to pay particular attention to uh, what that person is, uh, is doing. Uh, so a lobbyist is somebody who spends more than 20% uh, of his time on lobbying activities. And in 2014, there were almost 12,000 people um, who are registered as lobbyists and roughly uh, 87,000 people who deal with government relations uh, in one or another way. Um, yeah, so um, I mentioned a lot of, uh, a lot of times that uh, the the goal of of the lobbyist or you know the target is is to get things done to to get your mission accomplished uh, to uh, to fulfill your objectives uh, and uh, you know like in Bill's case when he was 14 or like in Bill's case when he was uh, 40 40 years old um, you you want you want to accomplish things however the mechanism uh, the mechanisms, even though they, they resemble, they, they become more complicated, they become more complex, more sophisticated. Uh, and unfortunately, there is no magic formula for, for everything. Uh, because there are so many issues that concern us uh, on, a daily, uh, on a daily basis, um, it is really hard to come up with one strategy which would uh, work for uh, every case. Um, however, a few useful mechanisms uh, which you know, uh, which you might find uh, useful if, if you would like to pursue uh, in um, you know in, in this particular field. Um, so it would be helpful to from right from the scratch uh, define your goals, uh, define your objectives and uh, time frames. Um, also, um, it would help if uh, if you could identify people who are on your side who are. Uh, who are like-minded, uh, like-minded individuals, then to identify those whom uh, who are undecided, whom you can uh, pursue, uh, and you also need to identify those people who are uh, against your particular cause. And uh, once once you know uh, those people and, and you've done your proper research about both uh, the topic, the solution, and um, uh, and, and and your stakeholders. Um, you go and you, and you talk to the stakeholders. You say that uh, you know my my issue or my concern is also your concern because we, we share this this and this because we have a lot of co because we have a lot in common. Um, and uh, uh, once you identify all all the stakeholders, you can gradually uh, amplify um, amplify your 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 message. And uh, you know, spread it to the people. And if people know about your concern, uh, people will, will will get on board with you. They they will help you to get this message across to the politicians, because uh, because in the very end, um, it is the the politicians or the legislators who uh, make the final decision. Um, <coughs> also, um, once you will start uh, your your lobbying activity. Uh, to to uh, to maximize attention to uh, you know to, to, to your issue or to your concern, um, <coughs> getting getting uh, some media exposure is definitely essential. Um, there are mul multiple ways how you can do it. You can do it the way that uh, Donald Trump does it. Uh, you know, accuse people and create some uh, uh, offensive sound bites, which the media picks up uh, just just in a click. Um, or, uh, or you know, or or you can uh, uh, you, you can do it a different way. You, there is also a way that um, uh, you can get uh, some paid advertisement. You can get uh, 
you know, digital content promoted. You can get uh, some print content promoted. Um, and once you start spreading the information, people will know that, that you're doing something. And if you're doing something, it's probably important to you. If it's important to you, maybe it's also important to me. Um, uh, and yeah, and, and this is basically the same as mobilizing um, grassroots and, and, and grass stops. So grassroots are regular people who, who read the news, uh, you know, who, uh, who, well, who, who live the, the daily life of, of, uh, of regular people. And if you can communicate to, to those people, um, and, here, and hereby we're speaking about a very large audience, um, um, you can unify them, and if they're unified, um, they can get uh, there and your message across to uh, the politicians. Um, and it's also um, essential to study what the opposition is doing, because uh, if you have something in mind, probably your opponents also have something in mind. And this may not always go in line uh, with, with your vision or with your goal. Uh, also, fundraising is, uh, is a very, very important thing even though it's, uh, it's down to the bottom. But uh, you know, ev we have to pay for everything in this world. Uh, so fundraising would definitely be an asset. Um, and uh, in the lobbying business, there is pretty much no limit. Your campaign can cost as little as, uh, let's say, $50,000, or it can go up to 50 million, 100 million, and so on. It really depends what kind of message you're trying to get across. And also, uh, depends if you are a student organization uh, trying to lobby for uh, you know, a, a student cafe or another couch in the dormitory, or if you are, uh, let's say, a, a trade union which, unite, which brings together uh, some 10 or 12 million of people. Um, well, uh, and then, um, as, you know, you know, as, as we have also talked, uh, it also helps a lot if you know the legislator in person, if you can dial the phone number, uh, and say, uh, well, how about we have a meeting? I have this, this concern. Um, maybe you could help uh, somehow, or maybe you can advise what would be the best thing to do uh, to uh, protect uh, you know, uh, my friends or you know, my family or uh, you know, my fellow members in a trade union or um, organization or company. Um, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, because we are very short on time and we have uh, two more speakers. Um, I would like to, uh, to highlight that uh, all of these things would probably take hours or even days to, uh, to talk about and, and to explain. Um, however, uh, I think all of us will stay here uh, after the event. We would like to, and if you have sorry, uh, uh, some time and willingness to learn more about uh, each of them, uh, we would be very happy to uh, to tell about it. Um, however, uh, I would like to wrap up with uh, my presentation with the last thing called ethics, um, because in the very beginning we uh, talked about this this guy Frank Underwood. Uh, well, you know, like any other person wants to get things done. However, the means uh, or the channels that he is uh, he's using they're not very ethical. Um, so, uh, in America, it's un unlike in the House of Cards, to be serious. It's, it's a very regulated industry. There are certain uh, do's and don'ts. And also, as I mentioned, uh, every lobbyist has to be uh, registered with the government, which means that his activity uh, is monitored. Um, there have been uh, numerous scandals about, about the industry, about uh, legislators abusing power, um, about lobbyists uh, doing some ethical things, uh, which resulted in uh, things which are even worse. Um, <coughs> uh, and uh, because there was some murky, shady business uh, being done for, for a long time, uh, in 1995 uh, in the United States there was adopted a Lobbying Disclosure Act, uh, which actually brought a lot of clarity and uh, uh, sort of, uh, shed a lot of light on the industry. And this is the document that required every lobbyist to register. Um, also, an, an important uh, an important thing is that uh, this document uh, regulates uh, how much money you can spend, and it also says that uh, you cannot do certain activities. For example, uh, you know, buying a dinner or a drink in a bar uh, to a legislator 
is also illegal because you cannot spend, I think, more than $5 uh, uh, wh wh when you're meeting uh, the legislator. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's a very interesting environment and it takes a lot more time to um, explain it in detail. Probably takes more than 20 minutes. Um, however, I thank you for paying attention and uh, hereby I would like to open the Q&A session. I'm Elizabeth, I'm a student. I would like to ask you, can you clarify, Alex, uh, about grassroots and grass stops? How can lobbies mo 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 mobilize them? Thank you. How can lobbies mobilize grassroots and grass stops? And who are they? I mean, grassroots and grass stops. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so grassroots are, um, are regular people, like, like you and I. Um, regular people who, who read the news, who uh, go to work, who interact with, uh, you know, with, with their friends, with their colleagues, um, and grass stops are those individuals who are the leaders of an opinion. Mm -hmm. So let's say a politician, or a famous journalist, mm -hmm. or a famous researcher, uh, or uh, you know, uh, this, this whatever guy on your favorite TV show, he's also an opinion leader, uh, and he would be considered as, as grass stops. Um, so um, how can um, a lobbyist uh, sort of uh, employ uh, both of them? Well, when it comes to um, people from the from the grass top society, um, it's it's mostly about uh, whether you have a really interesting cause, which would be uh, very interesting to them, and they will get and they will instantly get on board with you. Or it's also about a personal contact, uh, where you can say, um, uh, you know, we we used to work together, or you know, we come from the same background, and because and and that is why. Uh, my issue is also uh, your issue, um, and then it works. Uh, you know, like um, uh, yeah. ah, what's it called? Sarafan um, <laughs> Radio. Yeah, your yeah. favorite. Um, yeah. So uh, if you have uh, one opinion leader to speak about your issue, this this opinion leader will probably um, you know get his message across to a wider audience, and he will reach all the way to the bottom, uh, down to, uh, to the grassroots, to regular people. Um, and then, um, within the same framework, people start, if, if people know about it, they will start talking about it. They will spread information, and therefore, uh, evidently will organize into, into something and, mm -hmm. and create something. In things for presentation, you said that lobbying industry is monitored in the U.S. Who monitors it and in which way, just to not to allow some violation of rules? Whose responsibility it is? Actually, it's a high level, and we understand if uh, lobbyists work with legislatures, with the government, so it should be very high level agency. Thanks a lot for your reply. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so uh, by, by saying monitor it, uh, I do not mean that there is one person who comes to your office and sort of uh, checks what you're doing on your computer or uh, whom you have uh, a lunch meeting or you know, a, a drink at a bar in the very evening. Um, well, what I mean here is, is reporting. Then uh, when you work with, you know, with, with uh, let's say, with an NGO or with a company, with a firm, whatever, union, organization, uh, you have to sign a formal contract. You have to uh, directly disclose that uh, this organization um, hires me to lobby for uh, their particular cause, to advocate for, uh, for, for their interests. Um, and, and then, um, <coughs> um, well, and with this contract there is also um, you know, financial liability because you charge a certain amount of money for your service. And in, as in any developed country, in the end of the year, you have to submit your tax, uh, your tax forms and say that I received this amount of money from this organization and I paid uh, my uh, fair share of, uh, of tax. Uh, so it's, it's mostly about, uh, about reporting about the things you will do and have done.
Uh, I think there should be an addition to that because most of the monitoring is actually, uh, sorry, Michael Dosenko, US Ukraine Business Council. Most of the monitoring is actually done by peers in the industry, meaning somebody who is promoting the interests of Ukraine in Washington, D.C., uh, would uh, scour the internet and all other resources to see, first and foremost, the website where uh, you can search who donated, who, or rather, who uh, is hired as a lobbyist for whom and for how much and who they're working with. Uh, so Ukraine interest groups would scour that database and other sources of information to see who is lobbying for Russia. Vice versa, the Russian lobbies would, of course, uh, try to figure out who is uh, trying to thwart their interest. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not like a federal agency really uh, I, they do monitor, but, but uh, it's mostly the peers who refer to the violations. Thanks for the comment. Dan Solana, the Dropout Company. Uh, when you're talking about the, uh, um, this, uh, Register is talking mostly about the uh, uh, companies who are providing some services in lobbying. What about the, uh, the uh, house lobbyists in America? Um, well, w w w what about them? Uh, I mean, every uh, every company, especially uh, every big company, which uh, in one way or another uh, deals with uh, regulatory affairs, with that, that deals with the government, uh, probably has um, a government relations department or at least uh, one person who is responsible uh, for building and maintaining um, a relationship with, with, with the government. Um, and, uh, you know, well, what, what, what exactly would you like to... I mean, do they on? have to be in any register, or do they have to make some reports on the, their meetings and so on, so on, so how in-house in lobbyists' uh, activities, how it is uh, framework, uh, the framework in America? Um, so um, on, on one of my slides, um, I had this uh, these two numbers about uh, the number of directly registered lobbyists in DC, and then there was uh, I think it was uh, eleven thousand, and then there was the number called uh, which was eighty seven thousand, um, and that eighty seven thousand implied that uh, that is the number of people who are registered as lobbyists plus people who work for companies in government relations departments uh, plus you know people. Who do the same activity, uh, you know, in, in in any other organization or or group? Um. Good evening, Zier. I would like to ask: uh, Is there a such a thing as lobbying on the local level? Uh, can you tell us something about this and how does it regulates? And uh, one more question about uh, what's the difference on such scale, say, uh, lobbying, advocacy, and corruption? Okay. Um, yeah. So um, lobbying on um, a local level uh, is a similar, similar thing because, uh, <coughs> well, because, uh, for example, in America, there is the federal government, and then, uh, you know, that, then, uh, Every state uh, can also define, um, you know, it, the you know policy for uh, for each for each state, and you know the mechanisms how it works are pretty much the same. You have uh, legislators, whether on the federal level or on a state level, uh, who who shape policy, and uh, you know if if you get if you want to get your message across, uh, you sort of uh, uh, use use the same tools, uh, same mechanisms. Um, in the same way, it's just on the lower scale. Uh, <coughs> and then uh, the question about uh, lobbying and advocacy is uh, is, is very interesting. And uh, uh, you know, it, it 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 does sound similar that uh, you know lobbying and advocacy are pretty much uh, uh, the same things. Um, however, uh, because uh, lobbying had uh, such a long and not very uh, pleasant history. And uh, I think there was also a study uh, done in 2013 uh, in America which showed that um, only 6% of Americans see lobbyists as uh, trustworthy and ethical people. Um, and that is why, uh, you know, 
However, that, that was just the perception because it was not verified by, by some solid facts and, and figures. Um, people in this industry uh, sort of, uh, made a decision to, uh, to, to rename the industry and, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and call it advocacy. So um, advocacy is, is pretty much the same as, uh, as, as lobbying and corruption is, is, is a different thing. It's, uh, that's, that's something we do not really want to promote, at least in, in this event. Uh, but I think, yeah, done. And uh, yeah, I would like to, uh, thanks once again for participating, and I would like to give the floor to the next speaker, uh, to uh, my fellow colleague, uh, Yelena Prokopienko. Um. Uh, mentioned, I represent uh, International Communications Consultancy, PBN Hill Northern Strategies, where I work as a government relations manager. Um, I'm also an author of a study course on lobbying for Prometheus, um, uh, mass online courses uh, platform, and uh, I uh, work uh, as a national consultant for advocacy with the UNDP uh, project uh, aimed at strengthening, strengthening uh, business membership uh, organizations uh, for uh, small and medium uh, enterprises. Um, working at a consultancy and um, uh, having access to many clients, uh, we have uh, sort of a privilege or an advantage of uh, seeing government relations uh, market um, across industries. And uh, in this presentation, I would like to share with you a few of our observations uh, on the state of affairs in this industry and to discuss with you what we can do about it to, to improve it. Um, so. Uh, first of all, um, it's obvious, and it was mentioned in the previous presentation, lobbying and GR in Ukraine are not institutionalized, they're not uh, properly regulated. The lobbying law is yet to be adopted. Uh, there's a lack of uh, systematic fundamental studies in this field, uh, academic and popular, both. Uh, the market of government relations services is um, undeveloped. Only a few organizations provide government relations support in a transparent and civilized manner. Uh, there's a serious... Uh, uh, lack of government relations professionals on the market, uh, which is admitted by uh, HR managers uh, um, in the HR um, manager's position is not yet included in the state classification of professionals. Obviously, again, uh, the development of uh, government relations industry is still very much dependent on the activity of the international business in Ukraine, uh, which uh, takes the responsibility to promote uh, best global practices of civilized GR in the Ukrainian market. Uh, the most developed GR uh, divisions, GR departments, are traditionally observed in the areas where uh, there is a strong presence of foreign investors and uh, uh, where there is excessive state regulation. Um, pharmaceutical sector, agricultural, tobacco, um, alcohol, uh, oil and gas, uh, metallurgical industry, uh, telecom, um, automobile industry, and many others. Um, across industries, the companies uh, that are most actively involved in GR um, we can see uh, industry leaders of the biggest companies uh, in their sectors, uh, companies dependent on the state authorities uh, to uh, receive, uh, to, to secure licenses uh, or other uh, permits uh, for their activity, and those companies seeking to participate in uh, state purchases. Um, another observation is that uh, professional community uh, or associations of uh, lobbyists and HR managers um, is still being formed, uh, which means uh, a series of <laughs> negative consequences. First of all, it's a lack of uh, networking and professional development opportunities for uh, GR professionals. There's also, uh, there are also no uh, localized or adapted to the Ukrainian realities um, ethics codes for lobbyists and GR managers. And uh, most importantly, there is no proper body to um, oversee uh, lobbyists' uh, adherence to uh, the ethical principles and who could impose sanctions in case of their breach. Uh, also, there's a clear lack of understanding of the content and uh, the value of GR uh, among organizations. 
uh, particularly among Ukrainian companies, among domestic companies. As, and uh, uh, to me, as a practicing lobby, a lobbyist, it's a very unfortunate observation because uh, I believe that uh, the role of uh, lobbying and advocacy in uh, advancing your organization's agenda is great and the potential is, uh, is yet to be unleashed. Uh, first of all, um, uh, government relations uh, engagement uh, ensures advantageous positioning of uh, an organization among stakeholders. It helps to raise uh, an organization's uh, uh, profile and name recognition. Uh, it helps to avoid various crises, uh, legislative regulatory crises, and most importantly, it helps to transform an organization from a passive uh, object of regulation, fully dependent on the regulator's will, into uh, a full rights participant of the policy process. Um, also, um, government relations uh, engagement helps to enable not only to react to the suggested course of uh, a certain industry development, but to take an initiative to, to, to be active in the development of the industry rules and procedures. Uh, here are a few words about the tendencies that which we observe in the Ukrainian GR and lobbying sector. Uh, first of all, industrial, industrial lobbying is uh, very much focused on economic deregulation uh, at, the, at the moment, which means um, simplifying procedures for business operation, eliminating, eliminating um, artificial regulatory barriers, and in some areas, this means uh, shifting responsibility for quality uh, of goods and services from the state to uh, business to producers and importers. Uh, also, uh, there's uh, a lot of emphasis on uh, transparency and uh, anti-corruption efforts instead of uh, policy innovations. So there's uh, the companies and other uh, lobbying organizations, they distract, they have to distract resources from, um, from um, proactive advocacy for uh, global best practices, which, be, which, which would be necessary and good to uh, mitigation of regulatory crisis. So they have to focus on, on crisis and to, to kind of uh, to, to be defensive rather than to uh, bring best practices from their global offices uh, to Ukraine. Uh, there's a greater fo focus on uh, ensuring the adoption of legislation rather than its implementation. Uh, so there's an imbalance uh, we see there. Uh, there's a reframing, there's a trend for reframing of uh, non-public uh, lobbying campaigns and um, uh, public advocacy campaigns. Uh, the lobbying community, if we look at the, uh, at the, at the setup of, uh, of this community and who represents it, we can see, uh, first of all, industry associations, uh, business associations, in-house your professionals, both in business and in the civil sector, uh, government relations agencies and law firms. And of course, there's still a lot of uh, gray black insider lobbying, uh, which means lobbying by government officials, um, for the interest, in the interest of private uh, entities, uh, and it still accounts for a large portion, large, large share of all lobbying transactions in Ukraine. Uh, there is deeper integration of business and the civil society uh, in their communications with the government, uh, and uh, decision makers seem to be more willing and open to cooperate with business, but uh, there's still a lot of uh, chaos uh, in the uh, uh, administrative and political environment, that's why uh, it's hard to secure any long-term commitments. Nobody knows for how long they are in, in their um, positions. Um, there's more uh, collective lobbying uh, through associations uh, and GR agencies than individual lobbying, uh, probably because that is, that is uh, considered more effective at the moment, and um, there are less resources allocated in, uh, to in-house lobbying. Um, Instead, there is uh, an active utilization of um, associations memberships. So companies uh, allocate their uh, resources for advocating for their interests uh, to uh, pay their membership fees in uh, associations rather than uh, hiring uh, uh, government relations professionals uh, in-house uh, for budget budgeting reasons. Um, outsourcing of government relations services uh, to specialized agencies is largely project-based rather than uh, based on uh, long-term contracts. Um, so it, some of our clients who used to work with us on a long-term basis and with whom we had to retain our contracts are now shifting to project-based um, um, kind of cooperation, again, because of the uh, budget cuts in that uh, area. Mm, um, some of the most strategic and large-scale government decisions, both in terms of personnel appointments, 
uh, and the legislative amendments are most actively lobby lobbied uh, by international players. So we mean uh, uh, foreign governments, uh, financial donors, embassies, uh, because uh, at the moment they are among those who shape the agenda and uh, who are uh, the key uh, issue generators and um, opinion makers for the Ukrainian government. Um, I mentioned that uh, jar uh, industry is not regulated yet, but um, before it becomes regulated, before it becomes a uh, well-established practice, there's a lot we can do to actually engage in uh, government relations uh, activities and to do it effectively. Um, if uh, your organization has no experience uh, in government relations or would like to strengthen this function, uh, it can be done uh, in a number of ways. Uh, at best, you can uh, establish a separate JAR division, uh, appoint an individual employee, or uh, the most realistic option, actually, to include the JAR manager's responsibilities in the professional duties of um, employees of uh, related departments. Uh, if, uh, for example, you would like to engage in lobbying, which you, never, which you have never done, you can um, add uh, government relations uh, standard responsibilities in what you are doing right now. You can start monitoring legislation, you can uh, uh, generate position papers, organize meetings, and do everything that a jar manager uh, does on, our, on a daily basis. Uh, it's important to mention that uh, in order to, for the HR program to be uh, effective, it has to be approved uh, by the top management of the respective of your organization. Uh, what helps here is that um, usually HR managers are members of the top level management, uh, so uh, this approval uh, should not uh, be a bureaucratic procedure. So where, is, where to start if you want to establish a government relations practice from scratch? First of all, um, analyze uh, uh, the, the status of your organization. Analyze your organization's mission, business goals, uh, policy interests, what, what is it that you want to achieve uh, short term, long term. Um, internal structure, development strategy. Uh, then uh, be sure to assess economic potential of the region where you work. This will help you to formulate uh, your priority areas for government relations strategy. Uh, then you can, of course, uh, conduct a SWOT analysis of your organization, consider your strengths and weaknesses, um, internal factors, and um, opportunities and threats, external considerations. Uh, also, it is uh, important to analyze how your organization is already uh, related to the government. Even if you never engaged in government relations activities, you already have, you do have uh, this uh, t several t number of ties with the government. First of all, there are agencies that oversee your activity. Um, search for, I mean, do research in that area. As try to find out uh, uh, which authorities regulate your activity, what uh, their powers uh, towards you are, uh, how do they influence your activity, who is in the, uh, in the leadership of these agencies, um, what do they hear about your organization, what do they know about you, uh, do they know about you as a good faith taxpayer, as a good employer, uh, as an organization that um, uh, has launched a number of social initiatives. So this is, uh, the, these are the questions that you need to ask yourself to understand uh, what is the, the perception of your organization by the stakeholders. Uh, and finally, uh, develop a usable stakeholder mapping, which will help you to systemize your data on your stakeholders and uh, plan your further uh, advocacy actions and to distribute resources. Um, to, to, to put together a map uh, like this, you need to analyze the biographies of your key stakeholders, um, not everyone, but at least the key ones. Uh, identify their political, business, legislative, and other interests. Uh, verify their position on uh, the interests, on the issues of your concern. Uh, research how they relate to each other, and uh, organize stakeholders on your map uh, depending on uh, on their level of influence and the difficulty of taxes. And of course, you you can also add uh, other criteria, uh, such as. Uh, if you know their position on the issue, you can also add uh, whether they are uh, potential allies or opponents. Uh, there are a few resources uh, that you will need uh, readily available all the time if you want your government relations uh, practice to be uh, functional and uh, effective. First of all, you need to have access to a general legislative database and specific legislative acts uh, regulating your industry. 
Uh, you also need uh, rules and regulations uh, of the relevant state authorities to see what their powers are, uh, what their responsibilities uh, in your area are, and uh, what is the decision-making process, which is very important. Uh, you will also need a calendar of government events, uh, for example, the schedule of uh, cabinet ministers, uh, meetings, uh, schedule of parliament uh, committees and parliament sessions, um, and uh, events of other authorities. Uh, you will also need the uh, contact information of employees of respective departments uh, with, with whom you think you will work, uh, personal directives, uh, dividing responsibilities bef between uh, the officials of uh, relevant authorities. Uh, you will need the list of business asso associations and other uh, potential partners uh, with <coughs> related missions uh, if you want to uh, cooperate with them and create coalitions on various issues. Uh, you will also need internal rules and policies of your organization uh, readily available to you. Um, you need to know what are internal uh, limitations on engagements with the government in addition to those um, that are foreseen by the legislation. Uh, there are several uh, types of monitoring that you will need to set up uh, to, uh, to make your GR function uh, effective. Uh, the first one of them is monitoring of websites, of state authorities, regulating your industry. This uh, type of monitoring will help you, um, uh, will, will, will uh, give you access to draft legislative documents relevant to your activity so we can uh, express your position on, on those uh, documents. Uh, you will also see programs and action plans of relevant authorities uh, because it's, it's, um, um, it, it actually helps to, to know what those programs say because you can refer to them, you can appeal to them in your policy uh, positions, in your position papers, you can say that uh, uh, here in this, in this, in this item uh, you refer to a certain activity as your agency's priority and here is what we propose in this regard. So be sure that you know what uh, action plans and programs of your relevant authorities are. Um, uh, from this monitoring you also uh, see um, official events organized by state authorities. Uh, these are the events that you either want to, to follow to, to know what happened there or even to participate uh, such as open events, round tables, working group meetings or um, uh, committee events. Uh, personal appointments and reshuffles are also uh, something you can see um, uh, at um, uh, agencies' websites. It is critical to track uh, personnel uh, dynamics of your key contacts um, uh, in the relevant authorities. Uh, another monitoring that uh, I would advise you to do is um, monitoring of activity of, uh, your, of other departments of your organization. This will help you to better understand uh, the um, current organizational needs and uh, the issues that uh, your, your organization is facing. Yeah, so we can actually proactively uh, work on the resolution of those issues. Uh, this is first of all legal department, communications, business development, accounting, taxation, uh, logistics, marketing, and other business units uh, specific to, to certain issues. And finally, media monitoring, of course. Um, this, um, uh, you, you can uh, uh, track uh, what the media say about the key state, the key, key state authorities that you work with, uh, officials you work with or are interested in, uh, political developments and international uh, events with Ukraine's participation. All this will uh, help you to, uh, to, to uh, put your, uh, your positions, your ideas into perspective into an actual political and uh, legislative context. Uh, what does uh, a GR professional do on a regular basis? Um, first of all, mm, he or she ensures loyalty of key authorities and other stakeholders to the organization. Also, a GR manager identifies organizational interests and defends them before the state authorities. Uh, another um, purpose uh, and goal of a GR manager is to monitor, analyze, and interpret, most importantly, the legislative and political dynamics um, and their consequences for the organization. Uh, also, a government relations manager um, aims to broaden the network of advocates and allies of the organization among third parties, um, expert community, diplomatic missions, and other stakeholders uh, to ensure their support in case of need, to ensure that uh, they will be uh, allies in case of uh, crisis um, uh, in their communications with the government and the media. Um, also, a government relations professional creates uh, temporary coalitions on policy issues with uh, allies and um, uh, plans uh, advocacy campaigns and helps implement them. 
uh, if a GR manager cannot perform all those uh, functions um, personally, he or she should at least uh, coordinate them personally. Uh, here's a, a potential lobbying toolkit that will that you will need to uh, to set up in order for your government relations uh, department to, to to be functional and effective. Uh, of course, this toolkit will depend on. Uh, on the nature of the organization, on the uh, uh, legislative environment, on uh, um, on your customers, and many factors. But um, generally, um, government relations and law uh, professionals and lobbyists um, uh, they they use uh, the following uh, tools: uh, political and policy analysis, uh, legislative and regulatory monitoring, uh, setting up an early warning system to avoid a regulatory crisis. Uh, development of a safety network of government contacts at all levels, international, national, regional, uh, int intelligence gathering, uh, cross-checking and an analysis of insider information, uh, development of effective uh, lobbying letters and position papers, uh, organization of government meetings at various levels, uh, holding public events uh, such as conferences, roundtables, and uh, building uh, project-based coalitions and ad hoc alliances. This, of course, not uh, uh, and uh, here are a few more. Uh, client representation in business associations is one of the things that uh, are in the realm of responsibilities of government relations professional. Uh, coordination of public private partnerships, uh, development and negotiation of memoranda of understanding with state authorities. Uh, decision makers mapping, influencers mapping, uh, development of political and economic overviews, uh, preparation of policy briefs, fact sheets, white papers as necessary uh, to, to, uh, to, to support your positions, uh, arrangement of public polls, uh, other social studies uh, via research institutions, uh, political due diligence, uh, election campaign analysis, and uh, finally crisis communications uh, and management uh, again as necessary. Uh, there's a debate as to uh, what is more effective to actually uh, hire an in-house lobbyist or to uh, engage an external consultant. There are, of course, uh, pros and cons in both uh, cases. Uh, external consultants, they can provide you uh, prompt access to state officials relevant to you. Um, mm -hmm. They will help you meet your current GR needs, uh, but not the long term. Uh, because there's no development of contact network for your organization. Uh, these uh, contacts uh, remain with the lobbyist. He or she uh, keeps them uh, at his disposal. Uh, as to in-house lobbyist uh, or government relations uh, uh, professional, uh, it, will, it may take more uh, time and effort to secure access to officials. Um, However, there's gradual development of internal uh, government relations capacities, which is very important for long-term uh, organization development. Um, there is a higher uh, name recognition of an organization among decision makers, uh, and uh, there is long-term relationship building uh, with government authorities if you choose uh, an in-house lobbyist option. Uh, and finally, there are various ways, uh, ways to uh, structure, to organize your government relations function. Uh, however, the most effective one is the one that's rooted in your uh, organizational culture and that's naturally uh, fitted for your organization. And uh, I would like to share uh, several uh, keys of effective lobbying. Of course, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but just a few that you might find um, useful. First of all, you need to align your corporate uh, business objectives with the country's uh, national strategic interests and uh, policy realities. Uh, uh, secondly, you need to identify uh, key stakeholders and their issue positions. As I mentioned before, you need to develop a network of reliable contacts uh, on uh, various levels, and not only in the government, but also in business and uh, in the civil society. Uh, you need to acquire uh, in-depth uh, knowledge of legislative procedures and <coughs> political environment. Uh, you need to study international experience in your uh, policy area, in your industry. Uh, you need to also serve as a valuable resource uh, of industry uh, data, industry analysis for state <coughs> officials. You need to educate them and uh, to, to educate them on your policy positions. Um, and of course, it's very important to understand all sides of the issue at stake uh, in order to, uh, to be able to defend your position. 
uh, you need to demonstrate social value or uh, vice versa uh, or, or negative consequences of an HU position. You need to show that it's not your uh, corporate interest only. It's actually uh, aligned with the interest of the consumers or patients or um, yeah, the people. Um, you need to evaluate the effects of your suggested position uh, for the power balance in the respective state authority. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, that you need to evaluate how um, the support for your position will influence the life of the uh, official, basically. How does this influence his or her uh, re-election prospects, reappointment prospects, um, and uh, the, the political weight of this person in their respective authority? Um, you need to emphasize your corporate value and your corporate values. Uh, you need to act like an expert, demonstrate leadership, demonstrate confidence, and uh, it's also important to consider uh, the risks presented by vested narrow uh, interests, and you need to think how to mitigate against them by increasing uh, transparency around the issue and using your allies both on the international and national levels. Uh, you also need to appeal to the official's primary motivation. Again, uh, here you need to do research to see uh, what the statements of uh, uh, an official uh, have, have been in the recent uh, period, what uh, legislative initiatives this official uh, generated. Uh, and of course, I don't mean you know financial motivation or any other corru uh, corruption, uh, co corrupt, uh, um, uh, corrupt motivations, but I mean those that you can legally appeal to uh, based on uh, your knowledge of the legislators or an appointed official's uh, activity. Uh, you need to. Um, it, uh, you, you shouldn't uh, put your relationships or contacts at risk uh, for any one of your issues. Contacts are more important, and if you lose uh, access to insider information, uh, your, um, your resources are limited to open sources, and this is never enough for uh, effective lobbying, so never put your relationships at risk for any one of your issues. Uh, properly select lobbying tools, depending on the case, uh, consider uh, timing when to act and when to wait. Uh, select uh, the right speakers for your issue position. Uh, think uh, who can be more convincing in your case. Uh, search for allies, establish coalitions, uh, be proactive, be quick to react, uh, to adapt to changes, and uh, finally provide solutions uh, and um, uh, think uh, w what's the accept acceptable degree of compromise for you on every issue position. Um, uh, to, to finish my presentation, I would like to make a point that uh, institutional, institu <laughs> institutionalization of lobbying is actually broader <laughs> than, than just a legislative uh, framework, than just um, adopting the law uh, on lobbying. It's, uh, first of all, of course, the need for the law on lobbying, but also it's about a professional community um, to, to be established. Uh, it's about um, the emergence of uh, associations that could be uh, respected uh, among professionals and who could um, uh, oversee the ethics in this area. Uh, it's also about education, about academic courses, about the literature that should be available. Uh, and it's, of course, about organizational uh, culture, which has to embrace the need for GR and to create conditions for uh, its uh, sustainable development. So as you can see, there's still uh, a lot of work uh, that we can also do together in order to make uh, government relations sector uh, a well-established and civilized um, area in Ukraine. Thank you very much. I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you. Um, you had mentioned about You have mentioned about education, and uh, I would like to ask you, uh, how do you understand about academic courses, how it can be implied in Ukraine, in Ukrainian universities or college or some other institutions, mm -hmm. and uh, about literature, where or from what, which countries we need to take this literature, who are the best uh, in lobbying? Can you answer this, thank you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's true that there's no, um, like I said, there's no academic uh, education in lobbying or GR in Ukraine at the moment, but there are uh, a few educational opportunities uh, available at the moment. Um, 
well, I'll probably first of all mention the course that I developed. Uh, I can give you the link to it. Uh, it's a course in lobbying for Prometheus that I mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it's, it, it's an introductory course, but it will give you a pretty good idea of uh, what the, the lobbying um, industry looks like, what you can do. Um, uh, as a uh, as a young professional, and what uh, uh, tools you can uh, you can uh, um, utilize to um, to uh, take part in the policy process. Uh, then uh, there's uh, like as I mentioned before, there's a UNDP project uh, aimed at strengthening uh, business membership organizations. Um, one of the uh, components of this uh, project is uh, a four-day training, which is available online, and uh, you can also access it. Uh, and uh, there's a uh, there's a handbook that's uh, s soon to be published uh, on advocacy and lobbying uh, in the framework of this uh, project. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's a broader uh, publication, but uh, advocacy will be one of its components. And again, I can give you a link to that. Um, also, as to literature, uh, I personally, when I started working in government relations, I used uh, the U.S. literature, um, although. Um, uh, I, I think uh, I, most of the uh, sources I found were pretty outdated, so uh, I, I cannot recommend you any any more recent ones than uh, those uh, uh, I, I used. I think actually most of the government relations um, uh, tools are uh, the same uh, as they, they were in the uh, at the outset of this industry development, uh, with the exception of a few more that are related to the uh, technology development and uh, communications uh, development. Um, um, yeah, and uh, as to the list of literature I personally use to educate myself in this area, I can also give you the list of authors that could be useful. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, for me, it was a lot of theory here. Uh, can you maybe talk about the practical case in Ukrainian politics of the national level to understand the lobbying campaign? Mm -hmm. Thank you. you mean, well, uh, would you mean just just a brief overview of a case? Uh? Well, uh, I mean some some case here yeah. in this year, <laughs> maybe. Um. Yeah, uh, the, the most uh, recent and the most uh, interesting case that I was uh, that I worked on uh, recently was um, the case uh, for our uh, pharmaceutical client, uh, where we uh, worked to um, uh, worked against the initiative to ban advertising of medical uh, products in Ukraine, and uh, we effectively uh, ensured the. Uh, uh, the cancellation of the uh, draft law that was aimed to ban uh, all the uh, all the uh, advertising of med uh, of medical products. Um, to give you a brief idea of uh, what we did, first of all, we of course uh, analyzed what uh, a certain draft legislation means for our client, what consequences, what financial uh, uh, what financial uh, losses the company will bear if uh, it is adopted. Uh, we First of all, uh, I met with a uh, with a representative of the initiator. Uh, we um, understood his position. We realized that uh, it's probably more effective to work uh, indirectly through other uh, members of uh, uh, the profile committee and other committees. Um, we also engaged uh, our uh, business associations we work with and uh, generated uh, policy positions, uh, position papers from associations. Uh, in addition to business associations, we involved um, um, an association of advertisers and um, uh, patients so that uh, we, mm, we demonstrate to the legislators that our position is not about business only, it's also about uh, uh, independence of the media, it's also about the freedom of speech, it's about patients' rights to know uh, what uh, s certain products uh, uh, could, could um, could, could mean to them. So uh, that was the coalition building part. Um, and finally, uh, we <coughs> ensured the distribution of our uh, policy position among every member of the uh, of the uh, profile committee that voted uh, on this uh, draft law. And uh, we made sure that uh, they do not support it, and uh, the decision was 
the, this, the decision that uh, the committee made was to uh, to not recommend uh, to take this draft law to the uh, parliament's parliamentary session. So that was the most recent and uh, the most um, interesting case that I can remember. And uh, initiatives like this, they emerge uh, every year or two. That's why uh, we also think of a long-term strategy of uh, mm, not, not letting uh, advertising of medicines be banned. Uh, uh, so so uh, another uh, thing we do is uh, um, we, we keep informing our stakeholders on what uh, this initiative to ban uh, this advertising may mean. Uh, we conduct uh, public events uh, to attract media attention, to involve experts who can also uh, share their opinion on this. And again, it's, it's all about uh, adding publicity to the issue and uh, finding uh, your uh, proper allies, not only in business but also in civil society. Uh, patients, um, advertising associations, and others. Yeah. Uh, in your practice, uh, would you say most of the effort is going toward getting a certain law or sub-law uh, act passed or to stop them? Because in Washington they say it's more important to stop things from being passed than to actually get them passed. Uh, and has this changed uh, with the new government, I mean, with the new mean, uh, in the Kovish government as opposed to the uh, after Maidan government. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, um, I would definitely say that uh, stopping the legislative initiative is uh, easier and uh, it, it's uh, something you can do in a shorter term than um, letting, uh, making something um, be initiated from the very scratch and be passed. So, uh, and I don't think this has changed uh, since uh, the, the previous government. At least I do not see uh, any, any specific uh, change in that area. Maybe my colleagues can, can, can say more about it, but yeah. Um, I think, uh, uh, what, what the, like I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, unfortunately the business has no uh, time for the luxury to initiate good things. It uh, spends the whole time uh, defending itself from the initiatives uh, that can actually over-regulate uh, business. That's why, um, uh, it's the government that uh, initiates and the business that tries to stop. So this is important for the divide. <laughs> no? yes. um, probably the last question because we are really short. Yes, time. thank you very much uh, for the invitation and mm -hmm. uh, for the wonderful event today. Will you please uh, tell for the question only if you know. Uh, what we call in Ukraine uh, political corruption, in the in United States we call it uh, political lobby of the commercial interests. Uh, would you please uh, describe, uh, if you know, uh, what is the United States regulation of political lobby of commercial interests and uh, what is the difference really of the corruption and uh, political lobby of commercial interests? Thank you. <coughs> well, the regula the um, regulation of uh, lobbying in the United States was uh, um, was discussed by Alex before. I would probably not um, uh, go into details on that, uh, but I, I there's a clear difference between uh, corruption and lobbying. But the problem is that there's no uh, legal uh, definition of lobbying in Ukraine. That's why uh, the um, stereotype is that lobbying has this uh, element of corruption, which uh, we believe is not true. Uh, if um, you select uh, uh, lobbying instruments that are transparent, that are not behind the scenes, but uh, that can be uh, tracked and uh, show, shown to the public if necessary. So um, uh, th there is uh, always gray or black or insider lobbying, as I again uh, said before. But uh, um, lobbying as a concept uh, has nothing to do with that per se. It's uh, it's just the unfortunate reality that uh, uh, that, that uh, a part of lobbying is uh, conducted in an tr intransparent way. Let's see. Um, yeah, I think uh, we should stop here because uh, we have one more speaker and we are short in time. I will pass the floor to Dennis. Thank you very much. So we just warned that we have only 10 minutes. 
Uh, so we have to be quickly, and I have a uh, um, couple issues just uh, to add to what previously was uh, described by our fellow colleagues. Uh, and really, I'm very excited that uh, we have new generation of lobbies uh, in Alex and Helena who take lead in this uh, issue and uh, trying to educate and uh, uh, you know uh, raise the public awareness of these processes. Uh, because again, this hard work, institutionalization. Yeah, when it was in 2010, when we established this professional lobbying and advocacy institute, it was just question: What is this about? Yeah, uh, and I have only in, in this question: How many how many people from this room can call themselves as lobbyists? Could you please raise your hands? One, two, three. Still few. Yeah, still few. So the situation is really. Uh, the same, but uh, it's not the same is the, it globally. It's uh, very different in terms of the professional associations and professional sector. And uh, people who raise their hands, they do professional lobbying and they understand what does it mean. Because lobbying and corruption in Ukraine is almost the same. It's association of uh, almost the same issues. But uh, as we know, uh, you know, from the American experience, European experience is different. When it comes to corruption and bribe, it's all is other articles of criminal court and all the other legislation. Lobbying is the legal and professional instruments of uh, influence. And you know this uh, um, picture. When does it come? It comes from the front office of Euro Commission, right? And European Commission is very interesting in terms of developing the next model of lobbying regulation. I just wanted. Uh, I just want to stop on a couple of issues because we really run out of time. And just this picture is on the Lobbying in UA website is the uh, partnership, uh, long-term partnership between our institution and the American University and Center for Congressional Presidential Studies when people get a credit course in lobbying, in advocacy and lobbying. And twice a year they had a very intensive course uh, with uh, top uh, lobbyists of the United States and top journalists who just present their cases, present their visions, uh, speak about ethical issues, about algorithms, about regulations, and all this stuff. And Alex was among uh, those people who were selected to participate this year, because every single year we just select two or three people to get this opportunity to uh, get a certificate in the Public and Advocacy Institute. So if you're uh, interested in this information, you can just get it from this website and see in the uh, retrospective right, uh, how it was organized previously. In terms of regulation, it's very, very you know, hectic issue, basically, very controversial, because we have a number of countries where there already has the regulation. But it doesn't mean that it is effective. The effective regulation, you know, we, see, we think that it's in the United States. People in the USA, they don't think that their regulation is effective, because it, uh, it's very limited, it has very limited enforcement, number of uh, key lobbies they don't call them lobbies they call them like strategic advisors they don't go to this register right and people who know they're just laughing with this yeah and it's really a big problem and uh, uh, you know they have the first amendment they have constitution a number of articles which have the direct force and which entitle and uh, allow us uh, to do the influence on the government as well as the people in the United States. When it comes to regulation, as it was already mentioned, they have Federal Lobbying Disclosure Act of 1946 with uh, amendments in 1995. But in, 90, uh, in 2007, it was a big scandal. Uh, I don't want to ask because, because we don't have time, but it was a scandal with uh, Jake Abramov. Maybe someone, uh, some of you heard this. It was a prominent lobbyist who violated the ethical and legislative rules and procedures. But he said, actually, it was not major uh, violation of uh, legal procedures, but ethical rules. <laughs> because, you know, there were no any provisions which uh, limited uh, me for taking uh, code deals, congressional dele delegations, during week, uh, weekends to some islands for golf course and, uh, you know, some negotiations. In 2007, they have a very big scandal with him, and actually, it was imp he was imprisoned for uh, four years. But you know, uh, Jack Abramov, uh, his grand grand uh, um, parents were from Odessa, 
basically, so is this originality again with Ostap Bender association with him. Uh, 2007, they just cut down uh, some loopholes, but they still they, ha they have some uh, regulations and provision that make people and let them not get into the re register. One other issue that is very important is Foreign Agents Registration Act. It was in 1938, uh, as you see, and it was no, al uh, almost didn't have any amendments, basically. So what does it mean? Uh, by honest hloga, it means that people have, lobbyists have to register uh, either at the House clerk office or Senate office. When people act as foreign agents, it can be diplomatic missions, uh, foreign companies, non-residents uh, of US, any other entities, right? They, they already um, uh, fall under control of uh, FARA and they are registered but by Department of Justice. And actually they have a semi uh, year uh, reporting uh, with data uh, which we can see very often from the Ukraine Pravda, Ukrainska Pravda, some investigation journalism, right? And people get all this open data from these sources. And basically, in Ukraine we have a number of scandals connected with bribe, corruption, and lobbying. But we have limited reaction to these scandals which uh, have, you know, the um, uh, shape of some legislation, improvement on some other issues. Uh, transpa transparency register. Let's now shift to the European Union because they have a very interesting initiative. It, uh, you know, lasts for already maybe six or seven years, and it is a voluntary register, uh, now joint uh, register between European Parliament and the European Commission. And if you are lobbyist, and actually they perceive a lobbyist, a lobbyist any entity, legal entity or individual who has a target or aimed at influence decision-making process, either uh, European Parliament or European Commission. So if we can see here, so we have about 9,600 uh, entries, right? Major part uh, comes from professional consultancies. Uh, In-house lobbies is the, is the major, actually is the first. Non-government organizations, 2,000 think tanks, 600. Um, organization represented the churches and religious communities and organization represented the local, uh, local regional and municipal authorities. Uh, you see the, how, how broad is the list of individuals, right? The uh, list of actors. So even municipalities, when you are a member of local Congress or local parliament, yeah, uh, so you have the right to appeal and address and influence the decision-making process in the, uh, on the national or federal level. Um, there is uh, some statistics, basically, you can uh, see from the uh, visual graphics and uh, some other initiatives uh, which run by NGOs who can actually demonstrate the lobbying regulations, the lobbying actors in the European Union. One of them is lobbying, LobbyFacts EU, and actually if you just put here Ukraine, right, you can see a number of entities, number of companies, number of NGOs who have uh, here the interest how to lobby, uh, of lobbying and uh, state their interest in Brussels. One of the issues and uh, current uh, regulations which can uh, we actually, we are thinking of uh, and working on this, how to get this model and uh, adjust it to Ukraine realities is the lobbying regulation in Ireland. In Ireland, it's a, a relatively fresh regulation. It was adopted uh, in March uh, 2015, uh, but after adoption, they foresee some transition period. So they just put a website, they put there all the guidelines, all the procedures, and let people half a year to get acquainted with this, to understand what are the issues, what are the goals, are they uh, fall under the category of lobbyists, and uh, here you have a three-step test just to identify if you are a lobbyist. And then, starting from the 1st of September 2015, it was actually enforced, and uh, in January they foresee uh, already to make the first amendments based on the experience and the practice of implementation. Um, and here is the separate agency was uh, established, uh, which is standard in public office commission, which entitled to monitor the data, 
to monitor the register and react. Uh, there is a very big initiative, uh, actually, again, jointly by leading NGOs, international NGOs, NGOs, uh, um, uh, US and European uh, international standards for lobbying regulation. Right? If you just go to this site, you can see all the principles, all the recommendations, all the points which they raised and they recommend for uh, local national agendas. Um, uh, we can go through there and through the regulatory scope, for example, we have definitions of lobbyists. So uh, what does mean lobbying? If you just go below guidance notes, I don't want to stop on this because we have lack of time, uh, but you can go through the procedure and see their recommendations. They have actually the Google groups which just unite uh, the countries, the categories, and the people discuss what, uh, which issues can work there, uh, which issues cannot work, what can be adjusted to the local um, specifics, peculiarities, and to be uh, developed and supported further. Um, in 2015, our institute, under the support of International Renaissance Foundation, um, uh, did some kind of a survey of um, uh, the uh, models of uh, regulation of lobbying uh, globally. And you can just dow download these uh, results from the site of lobbying, uh, Professional Lobbying and Advocacy Institute. Uh, as the follow-up to this um, project, uh, on June 3, 2016, it was established a working group under the Anti-Corruption Committee of the Verkhovna Narada of Ukraine uh, to develop draft regulation on lobbying. And um, uh, Mustafa Mayem, a uh, member of parliament, uh, is the chair of this working group. And uh, uh, bes uh, besides him, we had 17 uh, members of parliament. And currently, we have 31. Or how many, Katya? 40, uh, eight. 48. 48 uh, now members of parliament who joined this initiative, actually. But uh, uh, we must say at this stage that each individual MP understands lobbying in his or her own way, basically. So uh, <laughs> there is no, t no unity uh, in understanding and perception of lobbying and what should be the framework for lobbying, what should be the model, uh, you know, final, uh, finally shaped. Uh, everyone wants some specific issues. Everyone from MPs uh, thinks that he or her is a real guru in lobbying. Understanding um, all the specifics and major, um, you know, trends in uh, um, European and uh, global perspectives, and it's very difficult actually to deal with this. Uh, so that's why uh, um, under this working group, it was uh, a formed like expert group. An expert group, it consists of members, uh, eight to members of parliament, as well as to key experts and representative of professional associations. We have EBA, ACC there, and other major associations. Uh, we have, we um, uh, held a number of working <coughs> groups, or fo focus groups, with lobbyist representatives from NGOs, with lobbyist, lobbyist representatives from commercial sector, who actually gave uh, their feedback, very positive, positive feedback, and very useful feedback. And uh, now we have actually the draft legislation, which is placed on the, again, on the lobby in the website. And uh, two weeks ago, we have the first uh, public discussion of this new draft legislation in uh, Lviv. And actually, it was very well met with some uh, practical uh, feedback. And uh, currently, we are th thinking how to accommodate this. We have a uh, no, uh, number of other uh, events uh, in uh, uh, other regions of Ukraine, Vinitsa, Dessa, Dnieper, uh, with final um, roundtable discussion in uh, Kiev uh, on the, on the support of uh, Ukraine Chamber of Commerce on their stage. So we think that this time uh, we go to some, uh, uh, you know, some prospects with some model legislation which can uh, uh, at least go through the first reading in the Ukraine Parliament. So these are the issues, and uh, this is a website where you can just get all this information from here. And uh, just uh, I wanted to follow up uh, if for a few minutes just to number of issues and questions which raised uh, from you, uh, from participants. Uh, the first one is the uh, uh, some examples of uh, practical um, lobbying uh, instruments, right? 
Uh, very re uh, recently, in July, we had uh, draft legislation 4496, which aimed at the regulation of export of services. And you, you know how big problem right now is for companies or um, uh, startups, right? Or outsources, for outsources uh, to uh, produce their IT programming uh, services issues and exports um, beyond uh, Ukraine. And it was because you, you, ha you need to get this contract, you need to have all these acts, you have everything to get translated into Ukraine. Uh, we built a coalition together with National Bank, together with the uh, Ministry of Economic uh, uh, Regulation and Trade, uh, together with uh, a specific association, professional associations. And we actually did a very uh, you know, broad grassroots uh, and coalition building just to uh, target and aim to some MPs. For example, Alexander Kuzhi, who was against this, right? And uh, to identify the key uh, stakeholders is very difficult, actually. To identify is not difficult, but to react and to approach is very difficult. So each individual stakeholders has an individual approach with individual message and slogan. And uh, it's very necessary to understand how big is your support, how many people is behind you, right? And uh, we demonstrated our support and with some you know, uh, professional expertise from the National Bank, it was a very good argument for her just to withdraw her uh, comment, her issue and support uh, this uh, uh, draft legislation uh, on the first reading uh, on the floor. And uh, now we have a second uh, time because uh, we are approaching the second reading and we have, for example, Yuzhanina, who is the chair of the tax uh, taxation committee and she stands against some provisions, very uh, necessary provisions for this. And other issues is um, uh, local, local lobbying, local regulation in the United States. You know that each state of US has their um, legislation, their provisions, their models of regulation of lobbying. Um, I don't know any states which doesn't have this regulation. All of them have. And if you, for example, um, head of subcommittee or committee or budget committee of Maryland, and uh, from one side you can be object of lobbying and uh, can be approached by stakeholders in your state. And, uh, but, you know, the budget process it takes maybe three or four months, right? The rest of your time, you can be a subject of lobbying at the federal level. And we have uh, a number of examples of such uh, people uh, who uh, are lobbied and can be lobbied and can lobby. And actually, one of the issues in the States, which is interesting, and in the European Union, is the state enter enterprises, right? Because state enterprises, they are fighting for allocation the, uh, of uh, additional funds, budget resources, funds, and uh, they also have to be registered, right? And uh, here, at current stage of Ukraine uh, development of legis legislation, we uh, put uh, some limit um, at the level of lobbying. So we suggested to the Council of Europe, who actually develop the model regulation of lobbying, that in our, our countries uh, of post-Soviet space, uh, the lobbying regulation should be transitional, uh, should have different stages. And in the first stages, uh, in Ukraine, we are developing only the level of influence at the level of Verkhovna Rada. After, next, uh, you know, after this stage, maybe at the next step, um, uh, we see that these models can be expanded to central government, to cabinet of ministers, and to presidential administ administration, president of Ukraine. And at the third level, after the administrative reform is completed, and we understand some issues and some final um, model of this, we can expand this model to a uh, local level. So it's very um, slow but ongoing process. And uh, you uh, all are invited to, to participate in further uh, cooperation with this expert group. Uh, if you have comments to draft legislation, which is on the website, please uh, do send this to organizers, uh, to my email address, to Katerina Bruhanova, she is the aide to Mustafa Nayem. You can just uh, you know, get her contact and we can move actually forward with this. 
if you have any questions, because every time I'm just pushed <laughs> to be quicker. Um, thank you very much. No questions? We can continue down soon because we have to close and clear the second floor for a while for technical reasons. Okay, okay. So let's uh, move downstairs and uh, maybe. Okay.